Welcome to the VPR and Vermont PBS debates. I'm Michaela Lefrac, one of the hosts of Vermont Edition. We are live in the studio, Vermont PBS studio in downtown Winooski, and we are here for the latest in our series of primary election debates ahead of Vermont's August 9th primary. Today's debate features the Republican candidates for the U.S. House of Representatives. Vermont's only seat in the House will be up for grabs this year. Let's meet the Republican candidates who want to represent Vermont in Washington. All three of our candidates are joining us remotely due to our COVID-19 protocols. They are Burlington accountant Erica Reddick, U.S. Marine Corps veteran and anti-war advocate Liam Madden of Rockingham, and West Charleston resident Anya Tino. All right, here is the format that we're going to use for today and throughout the 2022 primary debates. In our first segment, I'll ask common questions to all of the candidates. They'll each have 60 seconds to answer. We'll also have time for short follow-up questions and answers. In the second segment, the candidates will ask each other questions. Each candidate will have 30 seconds to ask a question and 60 seconds to answer. Follow-up questions are possible if there's time. Then we'll turn to a series of questions submitted by Vermonters. Candidates will have 30 seconds to answer. If we have time after that, we will do a lightning round of questions with very brief answers, 10 seconds or less. We'll conclude with one minute closing statements from each candidate. All right, let's begin with some questions for all three of you. Please limit your answers to 60 seconds. And a reminder, I may ask a follow-up question after you respond. Question number one, you are seeking one of the highest political offices in Vermont, but none of you has held elected office before. Please describe how your work experience has prepared you to advocate for Vermonters in the U.S. House of Representatives. Liam Madden, let's start with you. Okay, uh, sorry, we had a little mute issue there. I am a leader. I am a Marine Corps veteran who became the leader of the nation's largest anti-war organization of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. And I won MIT's Solve Award for Sustainability Innovations. And the main reason I'm running is because I do not believe that the two-party system is capable of solving our problems unless we create ways for the people to bypass politicians who don't listen to us or don't work to solve our problems effectively. So I think this is, as I've gone around the state and introduced myself to the public, a message that is getting resounding uh, warm reception and people trust someone who can think independently, who has experience in the private sector, in the nonprofit world, as an activist, as a champion for the people, for this planet and for Vermonters who are open minded, big hearted and down to earth. And Liam, you said on your website that your highest priority is to liberate Americans from what you call the death grip of the two-party system. Can you elaborate a bit more on why you call it that? Sure. Well, most people are, first of all, not Republicans or Democrats. Most people are independents. And it's because I think there is a strong recognition that the two-party system does not represent us. It doesn't solve our problems. It is driving us apart, and it's we can do so much better. If you look at the 2016 Republican primary, Donald Trump received 4% of the American population's vote, and he became the choice for 50% of Americans, roughly, and he became the president for 100% of us. If we think that it's a good system that is solving our problems, that can create a a uh, condition where a person who gets 4% is is elevated to be the, the most powerful person in the world. I, I think we can do so much better than that. Erica Reddick, let's go to you. I appreciate the question, Michaela. I, I want to start by saying I don't think Vermonters or Americans need another politician in Washington. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm a strong proponent of term limits. Uh, people want folks who have real world experience, not just academic experience. So not only ha was I on the planning and use management committee uh, when my husband and I lived in Hollywood, um, you know, I have lobbied with various organizations like Women's Rape Crisis Center to help change laws, uh, to make things more equitable and fair and safer for Vermonters. I also am a small business owner. I have 
have is I do accounting and small business consulting, and I've worked with businesses across sectors. So I have a really strong understanding of what people and employees and employers are working with. I've also worked very deeply to help at-risk youth and women in recovery from substance abuse. Erica, can you elaborate for us on what it is about being an accountant here in Vermont that prepares you to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives? Absolutely. I know how to do budgets, for one thing. Uh, one of the things with, you know, with a $30 trillion debt and climbing, we see the federal government just kind of like taking the money out of the pockets of American citizens and spending it generations ahead of where we are now. So what we really need is someone who represents Vermonters who and, and Americans who thinks about their pocketbook and their ability to pay and continue to take care of themselves. I have helped businesses and people recover from the verge of bankruptcy and devastation to save their businesses, make good financial decisions for themselves and for their families, and I'll do the same thing in Washington as Vermont's next Congresswoman. Thank you. Anya Tinia, let's go to you. Thank you. First of all, thank you for hosting this debate and for having me. I appreciate it very much. The government has always been for the people and by the people, so it is not a requirement to be a member of government to represent your state. That being said, I do have a wide variety of experience both in work and in politics themselves. I currently sit as the chair of my Republican town committee. I'm the vice chair of the Orleans County uh, Republican committee, and I'm the state committee woman elected by Orleans County to represent the county at the state party level. That being said, I've also sat on the platform committee for the Vermont GOP, and I was selected as one of three Vermonters to go to Washington, D.C. to represent the state at the RNC convention in Charlotte. Uh, in my work profession, I have experience with agriculture and most currently in management. And I believe that being a leader will come forth in Washington, D.C. as well. Now, Anya Tino, you have repeatedly declined to name the company that you do management work for. And this seems to be an issue of, of transparency. Why do you think the people of Vermont should not know the name of the company that employs you? The reason being that I am perfectly willing to name the company, and I will name one of the companies I work for is True North Reports, and I do office management and advertising for them. The second company has clientele from both sides of the political aisle, and they would prefer to stay out of politics. They do not wish me to name them, and I respect their wishes to be bipartisan. Let's turn now to the economy. Many Americans are struggling financially as prices for food, fuel, and other necessities keep rising. What is one immediate action you would take in Congress to help address rising costs? Erica Reddick, we'll start with you this time. I really appreciate this question. The economy is, is one of my priorities, one of the main uh, platform pieces, because when people can take care of themselves and take care of their families, a lot of the issues that we see with violence and things like that uh, are corrected in our community. So we really need folks to have as much money in their pocket that they earned uh, as as possible. We, we need to not give it to the federal government. We need to keep it in our pockets to take care of ourselves and our communities. One major thing that we could do is restore uh, the building of the pipeline in uh, from Canada. Uh, we need to make sure that we're energy independent. Uh, as we're approaching $10 gas in parts of the country, uh, you know, we're really seeing how important it is for America to be energy independent. So we need to restore leases, restore our ability to produce. And would you support additional sanctions on Russia, even if that meant higher prices for Americans at the pump? Would I support additional sanctions on Russia? Do you mean like making it so they can't sell their oil? Yes. Um, I mean, if if we thought that that was going to work, I think that that is something that should be explored. Um, however, you know, 
it's hard for us to say we're going to punish countries that are oil producing when we've cut off the supply uh, in other places. So if if the only option is Russia or Venezuela or China, you know, or the Middle East countries that that don't like us, they don't like European culture, they don't like Western culture. And so we've really been put in a position to be reliant on people that are our enemy. And that's why we need to restore production in the United States. Anya Tinio, it's your turn. So affordability is a very serious problem that Vermont has faced for many years and now the nation is facing. And I fully believe that Vermonters deserve to be at the forefront of American prosperity and that they can be. This will take making very serious decisions about bringing in business, about lowering taxes, about helping businesses to thrive in the state. We need to be energy independent and we need to be agriculturally independent so that our food sources are not dependent on foreign nations as well. I look forward to being in Washington, D.C. One of the things that I will be looking to do is to become a member of the Budget Committee and Appropriations Committee to work against over-government spending and to regulate government spending. The government needs to be held accountable for the amount of money that they've put into the economy that has exacerbated the inflation problem that we are now facing. And to hold them accountable will take representatives who are willing to do it. Now, Anya, on your website for your campaign, you list reducing unemployment as the number one way to fix the economy. But the unemployment rate right now is very low, 3.6 percent nationally and about 2.5 percent in Vermont. So why do you identify unemployment as a key issue? So unemployment is an issue because when people are not paying taxes, we get into a more difficult problem. When you don't have businesses in the state paying taxes, when people are living off state and not off employment, these things come to be. Unemployment is one of the problems we face. It is not the only one. I know for a fact that there are businesses in the state that cannot find workers. They cannot find people to work here. And yet when I recently took a trip to the American Southwest, everybody there is working and the economy is thriving much better than the Vermont economy due to that. So we need to make the very serious changes in this state to have people employed. Leah Madden, let's go to you. So I agree with Anya that uh, there's more money in the economy than there should be. And that's the, the definition of inflation. It's more currency than there are goods and services that are being sought in the marketplace. So one of the ways that we should look at this is at the root cause, which is central banks that inflate or or print money at will and largely just give that to the 1% in Wall Street. Uh, There's a few ways we can help. One of the first things I would do is we could link things like the minimum wage and federal benefits to the rate of inflation so that people who are on fixed incomes or low incomes aren't hit so hard. Two, we could tax the windfall profits of some industries like big oil and thereby remove some of that money that's causing inflation in the system from the the economy. We could, thirdly, we could um, add more services to the economy. And with my vision, that would be done through a military-scale civilian service corps that would help in the affordable housing and regenerative agriculture fields. That sounds like a pretty significant expense. How would you suggest paying for a a core such as one you've suggested? That's a great question, Michaela. I would tax billionaires' wealth, not just their income. Um, you know, we had several years in a row where Amazon paid no federal uh, corporate tax. That is just obscene. Um, two, I would reduce the exorbitantly bloated U.S. military budget. We are currently funding um, a military with the same budget or with a, a budget that is equal to the almost all the other countries in the world's budget combined. And I would tax uh, industries like big oil that are reaping rewards and are ultimately producing products that we need to transition our civilization away from. So those are kind of some of the overarching themes of where you can get money to um, help with some of these big projects. Let's move on to our next question. Mass shootings across the country have left Americans terrified, grieving, and calling for change. 
Vermont passed a slate of gun control laws four years ago. They included raising the legal age to buy a gun to 21 and banning bump stocks, which allow semi-automatic rifles to fire faster. Now, according to polling, more than two thirds of Vermonters supported those new laws. Would you support any similar gun control laws at the federal level? And if not, why not? Anya Tino, let's start with you. No, I do not support any further gun laws because we need to look very carefully at the fact that most mass shootings have taken place during a period of time when guns were being restricted from the people. Schools, um, the shooter in Buffalo, New York, focused very heavily on that area because he knew that the gun laws were very strict in the state of New York. Uh, church shootings, most people don't carry a weapon to church or they didn't in the past. Gun laws are not going to protect our citizens. We need to work towards finding the right balance of studying mental health and also looking on the reasons that are causing this to be angry. Is it being pushed on social media or the internet? Is it somebody seeking attention? What are the underlying causes of these shootings? I think that if anything, we should be looking at arming teachers to protect students better and that people should be allowed to constitutionally carry for their own self-protection and the protection of others. You just mentioned New York's gun laws, but of course there was just a, a horrific mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas, where gun laws are, are very different and the Second Amendment is valued by many, many Texans. Do you really think it's a state-by-state -state issue when it comes to where shooters are, are more active? No, I think that it could happen at any time in any state because we are not finding the causes of it. The reason the shooting in Texas took place, though, is a school is a gun-free zone. Nobody in the school was armed. And I, my heart and you know, my prayers go out to the families who have lost so much through all of these shootings. And I truly wish with all of my heart that somebody had been armed in that school besides the shooter and could have ended that carnage much sooner than had actually had taken place. It was well over an hour of waiting for help. And if somebody had been able to put an end to that sooner, it's possible we would have lost way less lives. Liam Madden, let's go to you next. So I am both strongly for reducing gun violence, and to do so, I am offering innovative measures that have not up until now been part of the political debate, which is what we need. And I'm also strongly for honoring the Constitution, which, until I hear otherwise, includes the Second Amendment, and I believe some of those Vermont laws are actually unconstitutional. As a former Marine, I realize that there is a vast difference between what legally qualifies as an assault weapon and what most of the public has in their imagination when they picture one. And the point is, According to the National Institute of Justice, nearly 80% of all shootings are with handguns. And I would add that nearly all of the shootings we must work to prevent were or could have been committed with weapons that were not assault weapons and by people who did pass or could have passed background checks. So we need to expand our imaginations about what is actually going to solve this problem because these measures alone clearly aren't doing it. And I encourage people to get a more full understanding of my perspectives on this issue in a recent op-ed in the Vermont Digger and the Vermont Commons and the Vermont Journal. But in short, it's supporting red flag laws that can temporarily remove guns from people when implemented by a local community of ethics. Now, Liam, recently you wrote an op-ed, I'm not sure if it's the same one that you're referring to right now, um, in which you said that liberals have their hearts in the right place but rarely know enough about guns to make effective policy. What do you know about guns that you think is missing from the gun control debate? That most, that 80% of all shootings are with handguns and that uh, preventing assault weapons from being sold wouldn't actually solve the problem. I know that but these mass shootings, uh, there's the definitions of what makes an assault weapon is largely arbitrary. So you could have a, a weapon with a five round magazine, and then um, if you turn it into a ten round magazine, the same weapon is all of a sudden an assault weapon. Or there's there's similar arbitrary definitions like that. So the same shooting could happen with someone who just used multiple smaller magazines instead of one larger magazine. And th these are just obvious to people who know just a little bit about firearms. And that's why we, we're frustrated with the debate being solely around uh, background checks, which I support, and, and assault weapons bans, because it doesn't really get to the root of the problem. Erica Reddick, let's go to you. I will never forget frantically calling 
my aunt and uncle in Littleton, Colorado on April 20th, 1999. Uh, two of my cousins attended a high school in Littleton, the same town as Columbines, which is kind of how a lot of this stuff started. It was terrifying. And I understand the fear that those parents and those families felt in Uvalde and other places. These tragedies are a reminder of the, of the actual human cost of, of child neglect, of addiction, and, uh, and broken families. And so, you know, this, these are reasons why my husband and I work with an organization called Catalyst and help uh, promote the Purpose Project. Right, Erica, the question was, would you support gun control laws similar to, the one, similar to the ones that are on the books here in Vermont at the federal level? And if not, why not? You know, if I believed, if I could be convinced that additional laws would stop the evil and the killing, I, I would support it. Um, but the reality is, 1.67 million defensive uses of a firearm every year versus 19,000 homicidal illegal uses. And so, um, you know, I think one thing that might be considered that no one probably will appreciate me for is whether or not we should seal juvenile records uh, for violent violent young people. Uh, the young man in Uvalde, had he been an adult with the same record, it would have triggered the background check and he would not have gotten the gun in the first place. Let's move on to the next question. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, about 11 million women left the workforce. Many of them had to stay home to care for children. This exodus drew the country's attention to how broken our child care system is. Now, Democrats have suggested that federal subsidies would make child care more affordable. Is that the right approach? If not, what is? Leah Madden, let's start with you. The United States is one of the few industrialized countries in the world that doesn't offer um, paid maternity leave. I am I'm the father of a three-year-old and a three-week-year-old, <laughs> three-week-old. And I can see just how uh, difficult it is for young families to maintain any sort of structure or continued productivity without um, without more robust childcare options. So I, I am for supporting um, and subsidizing childcare at a federal level. Do you believe in investing in universal pre-K, another type of policy that has been proven to help families? Yeah, the the younger you can begin to um, create environments for young people to begin learning, to begin to learn how to socially interact and to uh, see the world as an amazing place full of wonder. Uh, particularly with the natural world. I, I definitely support that. I do believe parents are also the best or can be the best um, conduits for that kind of learning and engagement for children. So I, I really, my first priority is to give parents the opportunity to uh, provide those opportunities, but universal pre-K as a secondary option, I, I do support. Erica Reddick, let's go to you. I think the question we have to start with is why is childcare so expensive? Um, I have had, I remember when my niece was born and we worked together as a family to babysit and take care of my niece and then eventually my niece and nephew to relieve some of the burden off of my sister. So we as a family were able to help with that. Now, not everyone has that option, but what we see in places like Vermont is that the state government has actually severely restricted people's ability to have local home child care. So whereas, you know, the gal down the street who used to have a business babysitting, you know, a few, a handful of kids in the neighborhood, that's been shut down and that's been restricted. And now people are on waiting lists for years to get into childcare facilities. So we have to look at what the government is doing to cause the problem. Well, what are your suggestions uh, for how to fix it? What, what do you think the government is doing to solve, to, to cause this problem? 
Well, like I just said, the government is restricting people's ability to have businesses and child care facilities. So, so are you so saying we, that there is um, too much regulation of child care facilities? Um, I, and if I, so, I think, what would you remove? I, I would say so. I, that is just the beginning of, of the issue. I also think it's really unfortunate in a lot of circumstances that people feel like they have to put their kids in child care. I would love to see an economy and a, 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 a culture where a parent can stay home and take care of their kids rather than feeling like they have to be a part of the rat race and earn, 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 make more, make more for all of the things and the stuff. I would like to see restoration to the family. And as your Congresswoman, I will make sure there are as few restrictions as possible for you to be successful in whatever endeavors you choose. So I think that I will speak to two things. The child care um, is extremely unaffordable for, for ladies who are mothers who are working in the workforce, fathers too. They, when you have to pay most of your salary out for child care, you're really not succeeding in your job. I would like to see government, however, stay out of it for the most part. I think that companies would do very well by implementing child care programs within the company and it would attract parents to that company to work for them. As far as universal pre-K goes, I would never advocate for that for the simple reason that we are seeing way too much indoctrination of our children in schools currently, and starting that at a younger age just seems to be a negative path down a wrong road. So I very much would stand against universal pre-K being government mandated as well. And just to clarify, you are against universal pre-K because of the content that could be taught in the schools? That is correct. I think that our students are not learning academics in schools so much as they are learning uh, a political agenda. And until we change that, I think that we need to limit the time that they spend in schools as much as possible. Education is not propaganda. And if you're teaching educational values, reading, writing, mathematics, and history, then we need to eliminate those additional uh, opinions that are being pushed to our children until they're old enough to make their own decisions about things. It, especially pre-K is a very vulnerable time for a child, and they should really spend that time under the learning of their parents and their family and people that their parents would trust with that. We have time for one more question before a break. Abortion is an issue that has created a major divide among Americans, particularly since a leaked Supreme Court draft opinion revealed the court could soon repeal Roe v. Wade. What is your stance on abortion, and would you support federal legislation that either protects or bans the right to an abortion? Anya Tinio, Tinio let's start with you. Yes, yeah, so... It's important for people to understand that if Roe versus Wade is overturned, it is not automatically overturning the right to abortion. And in the state of Vermont, it would probably have no effect at all on the right to have an abortion. It is merely turning it over to states to make that decision for themselves, which is constitutionally based states' rights. I would not support federal regulations on uh, federal mandates or regulations about abortion, and I would not support abortion being uh, a federal law as well. The, like I said, it's a state's rights issue. I am a Christian, I am pro-life, and I will continue to hold that opinion for myself and legislate in that direction, but I also do not intend to tell the states how that they should vote on such an issue, and it would go to the voters if Roe versus Wade is overturned, and I believe that is the fairest way that we can address this issue for all. And do you support uh, Vermont's uh, proposed constitutional amendment, Prop 5, that would guarantee the right to an abortion and other reproductive rights? No, I don't support Prop 5 or Article 22 as it's going to appear on the ballot for the simple reason that it is not written in any way that anybody actually understands what is going to be in that. They, it is a broad writing, and they deliberately did that so that it could go to the court systems and be interpreted in the court systems. Now, to me, it's not just about abortion. It covers a wide variety of things, um, including having uh, transgender surgeries and treatments uh, for children. You, know, you have to ask yourself, what all will this cover? Uh, without parental consent, those things can be very detrimental. And... I do not support Article 22 becoming law 
in Vermont, well, becoming part of the Constitution. Okay, and just to clarify here, uh, Prop 5 only covers reproductive rights. Liam Madden, yeah. let's go to you. There are other things that it could cover, and it is- Liam Madden, no let's go to you. Way. Sure. Uh, Probably helpful for everyone to know, I'm actually an independent running in the Republican primary. And as as the independent, I have a unique responsibility and perspective to remind everyone that it's very helpful to begin on this question with the reminder that each side is driven by love. And when we do that, it's much more difficult to make monsters and caricatures of each other. And I believe the vast majority of people on both sides want the best for everyone. We want women to have choices over their bodies, and we want babies to be welcomed into this world by families who choose them and love them and take care of them. So that's my first priority, is to encourage us all to remember that we do share this common ground and that we can disagree on this without polarizing so divisively. But my primary logic as, as a public servant is that it is an extremely dangerous precedent to allow the government authority over our medical decisions. So, sorry, that's my rooster in the background. Uh, if you have to remove all the nuance for the sake of a quick answer, I support the right to choose because I don't want the government dictating our personal medical choices. So do you support any sort of federal legislation that would protect, ban, or limit in some way the right to an abortion? I support a constitutional amendment that enshrines a human's ability to make their own medical decisions and to have autonomy over their bodies. I believe, Erica Reddick, let's go to you. If I could just add quickly to that, I believe in many uh, ways uh, the Constitution already has those things, but to make it more explicit, I think a constitutional Thank you, not. Liam. Uh, Erica Reddick, you have the floor. One of my primary uh, considerations and platform pieces is the family, and it is supporting the, the family to make good decisions, to take care of themselves, uh, and to make their own choices rather than having the government choose those choices. As an example, in Vermont, uh, and, and maybe this changed in the last year, uh, we give over a million dollars to Planned Parenthood and other abortion providers and zero dollars to pregnancy resource centers. So what the state of Vermont has done is said that we will allow abortion up until the point of birth and we will fund it. And to me, that does not sound like we're providing women a choice. It sounds like what we're doing is providing women one option. And 85% of Americans agree that third trimester abortions go too far. So to clarify, Erica Reddick, are you saying that, that women should be afforded some choice, but there should be limits placed on when one can get an abortion? 70% of Vermonters agree or believe that there should be no restrictions in the first trimester. And I think a lot of folks can agree that, you know, 12 weeks is a reasonable period of time to make a decision. Um, now, I do think that there should be exceptions for things like life of the mother. Um, obviously, we want to take care and consideration for both patients in those circumstances. And, um, and so I think that if we are going to say as a state that we believe in choice and we want there to be choice, we need to make sure we're funding both choices equally. All right, that concludes the first segment of the debate. When we come back, the candidates will have an opportunity to ask each other questions. I'm Michaela Lefrac, and this is the debate with the Republican candidates for the U.S. House on VPR and Vermont PBS. Welcome to the Hotel Portofino. How utterly charming. How do you find Italy? You mean how does Italy find me? Well, I hope you know what you're doing. It's beautiful, isn't it? You don't care for him. He's a fascist. You would be wise to tolerate him. We have a problem. Trouble in paradise. We shouldn't pretend that love ever trumps money. <laughs> Premieres June 19th at 8 on Vermont PBS. Hi, I'm Michaela Lefrac. And I'm Connor Cyrus. Together, we host Vermont Edition on VPR. VPR Vermont PBS will be hosting a series of primary debates. And we want to hear from you. To ask your questions to the candidates, visit our website, vpr.org, under the VPR Vermont PBS icon.
This is the VPR and Vermont PBS primary debate with the Republican candidates for the U.S. House of Representatives. I'm Michaela Lefrac, coming to you live from the Vermont PBS studio in downtown Winooski. Joining us for today's debate are West Charleston's Anya Tinio, Erica Reddick of Burlington, and Rockingham's Liam Madden. The candidates now have an opportunity to ask each other questions. The questions should be no longer than 30 seconds. Responses are limited to 60 seconds. Candidates can direct their question to one of their opponents. You can then either follow up with the candidate or pose that same question to a different candidate. Let's start with Anya Tinio. Thank you. So my question is for Liam. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for your service to the country. And second of all, I'd like to say that you have stated on your website and in various op-eds that you are an independent who is running in the Republican primary and you're doing so for name recognition and you wish to, uh, if you were to win, ditch the Republican Party and move forward as an independent. Is that still your goal? Well, yeah, I'm very upfront that I'm I'm an independent, and if I was allowed to run in both parties' primaries, I absolutely would. I think that would be the responsible thing to do to be able to reach out and listen to both sides. Um, that's what independents should do. But I I can't do that, so I'm choosing the Republican primary for a lot of reasons. One of which is simply I need to participate in the primaries in order to get uh, enough attention early enough to be successful. So I have to choose a side. And I need to choose the Republican side right now. One reason is because I, I believe that it's the more open-minded party and the one with a little bit more backbone around civil liberties as of lately, but primarily because there are hundreds of thousands of dollars being uh, flushed into the Democratic side of this election um, from out-of-state financiers. So I am ultimately um, running as someone who wants to liberate our politics from the two-party system. Anya Tidio, do you have a follow-up question? So, yes, actually, I would like to say, so it is your, still your goal to leave the Republican Party if you were elected as the primary to go forward in the job. You I, do I, intend on leaving the Republican Party. I'm not, I'm not a part of the Republican Party. I will and decline yes, I will decline the nomination of the Republican Party if I am nominated, so I will be an independent in the general election regardless of the outcome. Similar to Bernie Sanders, what he does with the Democrat Party. I didn't hear you. Similar to what Bernie Sanders does with the Democrat Party. Yes. Okay, you answered my question. Let's move on to Erica Reddick. What is your question? Thank you, My My question is for Anya. Um, given that you have run for this seat twice before unsuccessfully, um, can you tell Vermonters what you're going to do differently, particularly Republicans, what you're going to do differently in this race to have a different outcome in November if you get the nomination? Yes, I'm happy to. Uh, I think that it's very important to note also that there's no incumbent in this race this time, which definitely opens up the field. And I am looking forward to running in the general election against the Democrat uh, nominee. What I will do differently this time is not a lot. I can tell you the reason that I am successful with the Republican Party is because I speak to what the Republicans care about. And I believe that in the state of Vermont, we have the opportunity to bring independents and moderate Democrats to our side with the messaging about affordability, lower taxes, stronger uh, constitutional rights, and law enforcement. The city of Burlington is struggling very severely with a lack of law enforcement and rising crime. These are all talking points that I don't believe just Republicans care about. I think that all parents care about their children. I think that we want border security. I think that we need to stop the inflation and have more affordability in our state. And these are all things that I will talk about and I will work on in Washington, D.C. Erica Reddick, do you have a follow-up? Yes. I, I didn't hear you say, Anya, what you will do differently this time to ensure a different outcome. I would so say that, that I'm working do differently, not the what is how is the political environment different? 
I would say that what I'm doing differently is I'm working on a larger funding base and that I will have more name recognition going forward. Let's move on. Leah Madden, what is your question? Uh, this is for either, but if I have to pick one, it would be Erica. Um, so Erica, we fished over 90% of the big fish out of the oceans and we're extincting species at a rate thousands of times faster than the natural historical historical rate. And we're using up precious materials like fossil fuels uh, in a way that will deplete them in our lifetime. So I'm wondering, is our civilization and our economy that drives it sustainable? And how would you advise we shift to an economy that is based on the limits of the reality of this planet? I, I love this question. Uh, I really actually appreciate this question, Liam. The, the biggest thing that I think we can all do as Americans, and this requires no regulation, no force from the government or anything, we as Americans and as human beings need to reduce our consumption. Every environmentalist worth their salt will tell you that we can make all the solar panels and EV cars we want, which also are made with rare earth minerals that we're running out of. And oh, by the way, it's toxic waste. Um, the, the one thing that we can do is reduce our consumption. Um, that's why everyone picks on me because I still have a Galaxy S8. I don't care. It works. Um, I don't replace my phones every year. I don't replace my laptop every year. I reduce the amount that I consume. I make sure that I reuse things that I can. That old adage, reduce, reuse, recycle, has to be at the forefront of every American's mind, regardless of what we're talking about. Leah Menon, do you have a follow-up question, or would you like to pose your original question to Anya Tino? I do have a follow-up. So our economy, Erica, is driven be, uh, by a premise of never-ending growth because we have interest-bearing debt uh, making, uh, I could teach a lesson on, on that, but <laughs> how, do you, how do you ensure that um, reducing consumption continues, uh, is, viable, is a viable strategy when we have a, an economy that requires never-ending growth? Uh, well, first things first is not having the federal government and the Fed deciding a lot of those policies. So when you talk oh. about interest bearing debt, that is money borrowed by the federal government and in to pay for things oftentimes that are, are not useful for the American people. Like, why did we give millions of dollars to a study to find the, the effects of cocaine on pigeons? We did not need to borrow money for that. <laughs> this concludes the second segment of our debate. When we come back, the candidates will answer questions submitted by Vermonters. I'm Michaela Lefrac, and this is the debate with the Republican candidates for the U.S. House on VPR and Vermont PBS. The PBS NewsHour, putting questions to those in power. We're in the fourth wave. There aren't enough tests. Is it time for a new approach? Providing insight into big issues. The speech in many ways sets the foundation for Democrats as they renew their push for voting rights. Focusing on underreported issues. What are these girls missing while their mothers are in prison that you're trying to help them get? Weeknights on your PBS station and online. Hi, I'm Michaela LaFrac. And I'm Connor Cyrus. Together, we host Vermont Edition on VPR. VPR Vermont PBS will be hosting a series of primary debates. And we want to hear from you. To ask your questions to the candidates, visit our website, vpr.org, under the VPR Vermont PBS icon. Welcome back to the primary debate with the Republican candidates for the U.S. House on VPR and Vermont PBS. I'm Michaela LaFrac. With us today are Rockingham's Liam Madden, Anya Tino of West Charleston, and Burlington's Erica Reddick. It is time now for some questions from Vermonters. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. And just a reminder, candidates, please limit your answers to 30 seconds. All right, question number one. 
Irvin in Northfield asks, what specific legislation do you believe is needed to combat and mitigate climate change? And I would like to tack on here, do you think that the federal government should take steps to discourage fossil fuel use through taxation? Erica Reddick, let's start with you. Oh, gosh, I don't know which one of those to answer. Um, I think that the federal government is already doing a great job of making the cost of fossil fuels go up. Uh, you know, what we're seeing for gas prices right now, the, the pain that we're feeling at the pump is a feature, not a bug. The Biden administration, as well as many in Congress, have actually said they're going to create a circumstance where gas and, and fuels will be too expensive. And I would like to give you 10 more seconds here to, to name a specific strategy that you would advocate for in Congress. I don't believe it is the role of the federal government to, um, to pick winners and losers. When they do, it goes very badly. We saw that during the Obama administration. Liam Madden, let's go to you. Hi, Irvin. Uh, I think it's a good baseline to know that I'm the only candidate in this election who won MIT Solve Award for Climate Change Innovations, and I'm the only one who's currently a renewable energy professional. So I have a uniquely informed perspective, and it's that human activity is unsustainable for many reasons other than including our greenhouse gas emissions, and that we need to expand the discussion about sustainability to be more than just climate, and to look at the root cause which is not just about what technologies we use, but it's also related to the fact that we ha we need a new economic system that doesn't premise itself on growth forever with no consequences to the natural world. So I think we need to invest a lot in uh, nuclear energy. Of uh, course, you, I believe- uh, Liam, I'm sorry. gonna have to cut you off. Anya Tino, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for the question. First, I'll answer your question, Michaela. No, I don't believe that the federal government should be punishing people for the use of fossil fuels, and especially when they've not put forth any sustainable uh, alternatives. To the other question on climate change from Irvin, thank you, or Irvin, or Irving? Irvin. Irvin, sorry, Irvin. I will say that the Green New Deal is not the way forward, and I would want to do some very serious research to find the best way forward for climate solutions. Let's move on to our second question from a listener. Peter in Shelburne asks, what specifically will you do to address the polarization of Congress? Mm -hmm. Liam Madden, let's start with you. Peter, this is my favorite question. Well, as an independent, for one, I just won't contribute that much to it. <laughs> um, two, I believe that we need ways for the people to bypass politicians. Over half the states have ballot initiatives where people can put laws on the books or remove bad ones. And we need that at a federal level. And we need to do that online because we need citizen participation way more than every two or four years. And we need um, forums. We need term limits. We need um, election finance reform. And we need to uh, have these forums where people can generate ideas and solutions that work across ideological chasms. Thank you. Anya Tino, the floor is yours. So when you face the difficulties that we're facing in our state and nation, there is going to be polarization because people feel very strongly one way or another about it. In Congress, however, I will work to make sure that I find common ground with uh, the other side and work together with them on that legislation. I don't know how much that they would be willing to come across the aisle to work with me, but I'm always willing to work with others. And I will also work very closely with my GOP counterparts to further legislation to benefit the state of Vermont. And Erica Reddick, how would you address polarization in Congress? The main thing that I will do is not participate in it and remember why I'm there. So my job as Vermont's Congresswoman is going to be to represent Vermonters. And Vermonters, by and large, are not nasty people. We are, we are loving, caring neighbors who want the best for ourselves, for our families, and for our neighbors. And so I will lead by example in Washington. We have time now for a lightning round before the end of the debate. Now, candidates, please keep your answers to 10 seconds or less. Question number one, who won the 2020 presidential election? Anya Tino, let's start with you. 
Joe Biden was inaugurated. Who won? Well, I think that we all know Joe Biden was inaugurated president, and that's who's sitting in the White House. Lee, Leah Madden. Uh, Joe Biden won the election, but the elites that control this company won the election even more. <laughs> and Eric Reddick. Uh, I would say Joe Biden. All right. Question number two. How would you describe what happened on January 6th, 2020? Anya Tino. Inaccurately reported on. Leah Madden. Uh, riot gone amok. You are allowed to use more than three oh, okay. <laughs> words. Yeah, I believe that the people who were involved in the, the riots were, uh, by and large, not there to topple the United States government. And um, I am wary of Eric narratives that try to pit people against each other. Thank you. Erica Reddick. I would describe the events of January 6th as deeply sad and uh, and disappointing and upsetting. I think it's tragic anytime people feel like they have to resort to violence to be heard. Thank you. We now have time for one minute closing statements from each candidate. The order was determined randomly before the show and Anya Tino, you will start us off. Thank you. And thank you again for hosting this debate and giving us a chance to speak to Vermonters about the positions that we hold and how we will represent them in Washington. I look forward to going to Washington, D.C. because I know that with my work ethic and my background, I will be a strong representative for the state. I will make sure that everything that I do has your best interest in mind. And I look forward to being able to affect positive solutions for the state of Vermont. I will always stand up for your constitutional rights. I am pro Second Amendment, but I'm pro every constitutional rights. I will work to lower taxes and create affordability and better business opportunities in the state. I support law enforcement, military, and veterans. And I look forward to being able to help address the border security crisis and the humanitarian crisis that it has become as well. We must fight against the inflation and the rising cost of living and become energy independent and agriculturally independent. As your representative, I will do all the things that I promise you that I will do and I will be a strong leader for this state. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next in our randomly generated order is Erica Reddick. This election, more than some in the past, is really about restoring faith uh, to the people, to Vermonters and Americans, that they, in fact, are in charge and have control over their government, uh, uh, over their government. Our form of government means we are to be self-governing. That means we all have to be participating. And so I just plead with Vermonters, get out and vote this year, participate, help a campaign. Remember that you have power, that you are the top in this government. Go to ericareddick.com, learn more about my campaign. There you can sign up for the newsletter and get in touch with any questions that you have. And check out my podcast. It's called Generally Irritable on Facebook and YouTube, where we go into deep depth discussions about the problems facing Vermont and America. Thank you. And finally, Leah Madden, your closing statement. Hi, fellow Vermonters. One of the reasons I'm running as an independent is because I believe we need the values of both sides to build a healthier society. We need personal responsibility as a core value from the right. And we need a community mindset that helps us improve the soil from which we as individuals grow, which I see as a core value of the left. In short, we need both strong individuals and nurturing communities. And the two-party system is not capable of delivering that or solving our problems unless we create ways for the people to bypass politicians who don't listen to us. And we all know that the two-party system does not represent us or solve our problems, and it is controlled by elites while driving us apart. So we need innovations because if we don't get way better at solving problems together, if free and open societies don't embrace using technologies to help us work together, then the future is going to belong to elites and authoritarians. And I'm asking for your help in revolutionizing how we work together. And I'm asking you to listen to your heart and join us in rebirthing democracy. 
This concludes the primary election debate for Republicans running for U.S. House on VPR and Vermont PBS. Thank you to all three candidates who joined us today. Burlington accountant Erica Reddick, U.S. Marine Corps veteran and anti-war advocate Liam Madden of Rockingham, and West Charleston resident Anya Tino. You can join us again for our next debate tomorrow, where my Vermont Edition co-host Connor Cyrus will moderate a debate with the Democrats seeking a seat in the U.S. Senate. Today's VPR Vermont PBS debate was produced by Matthew Smith, Brian Stevenson, Holt Albee, Mike Dunn, Dave Rice, Frank Alwyn, Peter Angish, and James Stewart. Our music is by Eric E. Wazen and the New Trombone Collective. I'm Michaela LaFrac. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll catch up again soon.